Yeah. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Chris. All right. Excellent. Hi, welcome to Community Conversations. Uh, my name is Courtney Shaw and I'm the facilitator of the series, which basically means I welcome in the guests and introduce them, but I'm not like teaching the show. That's, that's for other people to do here. Um, but I wanted to let you know that we do have events for the next eight weeks here. So in on the back side tables, we have the schedule. So if you wanna know what other events we have, those are on the schedule there. Uh, the flyer also has the web address for our website, which has the full schedule, as well as little blurbs about the various talks and the link for the website that has the Zoom um, uh, the Zoom links as well. So if there's some time that you want to hear the talk, but you don't necessarily want to come to campus, that's the option for you. We also record all the events and put them up on the YouTube, the LCC YouTube channel. So you can always get these later. If you hear brilliant things today, which you will, uh, and you want to share them with a friend, point them in the direction of the YouTube channel once that's up. Uh, and usually in a few days that gets up. If you're here for Humanities 106, uh, you will be watching this and then writing a paper on it, one page paper due on Tuesdays. See me if you have any questions on that. And now I would like to introduce today's speaker. And I always love when I get to welcome a new person into the community conversations fold. So Adrienne Godshalks got her PhD at Portland State University. She teaches microbiology here at LCC and is perpetually curious about what is meant to be alive, which led her to her current role investigating the tiniest living beings. Adrienne enjoys gardening, watercolor, and goes to hip hop class every Friday. Please welcome Adrienne Godshalks. Thank you so much, Courtney. How's my sound? We good? All good? Excellent. And Courtney, I think the camera, if you wanted to fiddle up here, you're welcome to. The camera seems to be off. So if you wanted to activate that, you won't bother me if you're playing with it. So feel free to do what you need to do. Okay, let's get rolling. Welcome, may the microbes be ever in your favor. Does anyone uh, guess what that's a, a reference to? This is a conversation. Actually, it's community conversations. Hunger Games, we'll get there. Excellent, yep. So this whole theme is about technology and change, which I am not an expert in technology or change. Um, my therapist and I are working on that. But the um, I'm also not an expert in microbiology or agriculture or really a lot of things. But I'm a very curious hum human that has gone from a lot of different areas. So I started out. And if I'd followed my high school career path, I would want, I would probably be an environmental lawyer fighting to save all the old trees. And law turned out to be harder for me than I wanted it to be. Um, and then if I'd followed my college self, I probably would be uh, seasonally employed at an outdoor school and a summer camp for most of the year. And if I'd followed my grad school dreams, I would be a professor at a major research university with a lab that was studying plant physiology and the stomatal opening, closing, and whether the amount of nitrogen in that tissue is affecting that. And I'm really grateful that none of that happened because I get to be here with you and I get to think about a lot of really cool things. So what I'm about to talk to you about is an amalgamation of the ideas that have been really exciting me over the last few years and have given me hope. So we're gonna go through a lot of not hope in order to get to the hope. So bear with me. Is this a clicker? Does this work? No? Mouse, yeah. Oh, too far. There we go. So I learned about this tilted framework, transparency in teaching and learning recently, learning and teaching, tilt. Um, and so the basic structure is I'm going to tell you why we're here, what's our purpose, and then we're going to talk about what our tasks are today, and I'll tell you what our criteria for success is. So our purpose is to learn about how our tiniest collaborators have been rooting for us very intimately. The tasks are first we're going to recognize technology that came before we knew about microbes and how that's affected them. And then we're going to change our relationship to microbes and after that, we're gonna consider what could become possible if we cultivate diverse communities. And that's very broad on purpose. And then our criteria for success today is to leave with a good gut feeling about community diversity. Hint, hint, it actually has to do with your gut. 
So again, may the odds be ever in your favor was a quote from Effie Trinket in The Hunger Games. And it's a little bit um, eerie and creepy because she's very decked out and like polished and like, sometimes I feel like this is my relationship with Effie or with uh, technology sometimes. And I'm kind of like, wait, what? Like you're being really positive about these things that are causing a lot of de devastation and harm and people are dying. And uh, like, I kind of feel like this sometimes um, because sometimes I feel like the world favors technology at a pace before we can really think about and understand all of the long-term generational implications of those. Um, and it's caused a lot of harm in the world. So let's talk about some of them. The first thing is for you to click in and get to this. And since this is a community conversation, I wanna hear from you first about these technologies. So go ahead and use your, I'm gonna leave this one up here. So I'm gonna change this. Da -da. Okay, technology that has long-term consequences. Can you think of any examples or general feelings about them? And if you don't have a phone on you right now, that's totally fine. Turn to the person next to you and talk to each other. And if you have a phone and you still wanna to talk to each other, that is also welcome. <laughs> There's a lot of choices. Pick one or two that you find interesting. I have a whole list for you, so we'll get there. Say that one again. Yes, answer this question or any feelings like sad, anger, excitement, whatever you have to say. It can be simple. You also will have the option to enter multiple. So you can enter one, hit enter, hit another one, enter. And this will be active and live. AI, yes, interesting, big one. What are technologies, pesticides, social media, war, the internet, technology that has long-term consequences? And these consequences could be some good, some bad, mostly bad, mostly good. I'm obviously using technology right now, and I don't know what this consequence is going to be in your life by having you do this today. Um, radiation, cell phones, GPS. Yeah, I don't know how to get anywhere without my phone anymore. It's crazy. <laughs> Long-term consequences. Automation, consume, excessive, disengage. This is a, an excellent example. So feel free to keep adding them and we'll check back in here and it'll stay there. Um, but I'm gonna tell you about one story from the plow. That simple technology that if you pick up any anthropology textbook is the thing that changed us from hunter gatherers to farmers. And I will tell you right now, that's a myth that there were very civilized, uh, very um, complex civilizations that were managing land long before we invented the plow as human beings. So let's talk about the plow. The plow didn't start looking like this. This is an image of a very a farther along iteration of a plow that can come and till and it digs up the soil. And just like the probably the extension, extension agency recommended, you can put out your cover crops and then you till that back into the soil to get those nutrients back into the soil, right? That's what we know. But let's see what's really happening. So. Yes, if we zoom really in into a teeny tiny spot in that soil, essentially what we're seeing is that every little micro pocket of a soil that had an intact root system was established by all of these different organisms. And I, I like to think about soil pores and soil structure, kind of like our structures, right? Devastation happened when apartment buildings collapsed. 
this was a photo I took in Italy of folks over a bridge. We need some structures that have bigger pores, bigger holes in them so that water can flow through them like this river. And then we have a lot of little tiny holes like windows and we have bigger holes that doorways and rooms like this that if we didn't have this space, um, well, today is a lovely day. It'd be great to be outside. But if you think about all of the structures that keep us happy and healthy, that's the true for microbes too, just on a together. So we've got fungi that weave together and they are the lassos in the soil for the big pieces. We've got mycorrhizal fungi that are connecting directly and tapping into roots and forming little tree structures in between and inside cells. And we have bacteria that are um, on a micro scale doing the same thing. We've got filamentous actinobacteria and mycetes and we have um, all kinds of bacteria that are all exuding their capsules to to stick and stay to something and forming those biofilms that we're learning about in this week in micro class um, that allow them to stay and not get washed away in a heavy rainstorm. And so those glues allow other particles to stick and create this in interesting habitat. So when we're, so think of this image for the next few slides when we talk about what the plow did. So th these are all things we didn't know about or the folks, I, I assume the folks, I'm gonna assume the best, the folks who designed the plow did not know about this, that coming through and totally like upending and, and bulldozing this would allow only the bacteria to survive. And when we allow only bacteria to survive without predators, that's like having only deer or moose in a, in a grassy habitat without any wolves to keep those populations in check. And what happens is that all of that nicely tilled in green material that was adding nutrients back to the soil, it, it's food. But they're like, yes. So they go to town and they multiply, they go crazy. And all of their um, bacteria are made up a little bit different than we are. They are, we're about 30 to one carbons for every nitrogen. And bacteria are a lot more juicy. They're a lot more nitrogen rich. They only have five carbons for every one nitrogen, which means they have a lot more nitrogen in their bodies. So they spit out a lot of carbon. They don't need as much CO2. So they're taking in all that grass material that just got mixed in and they're exhaling. They're exhaling CO2 into our atmosphere every time we till. Has anyone heard of carbon dioxide and something called climate change? <laughs> uh huh, uh huh, great. Also, has anyone heard of nitrous oxide or N2O that has, um, also devastating effects that can combine with in the atmosphere and become ground level ozone and cause crazy health problems. Um, atmospheric chemistry, also not my specialty, but I do know a few things and I know that that's bad. So um, I'm gonna briefly show you, let's not have you talk. So this is a video I saw in one of Ray Archuleta. He's a proponent of regenerative agriculture. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. These are carbon dioxide patterns around the world. And right now, so this is the month, right now we're in February, and you can see that there's a little bit more red. The more red into even white and purple is more and more carbon dioxide. So here we're getting more CO2, more CO2, and we're getting into April. And look, there's little pulses of green. So interestingly, what happens right before crops are growing when we get this really intense dark red is farmers preparing their fields. So one proposal that Ray makes is that the CO2 emission is following the seasonal conventional tilling globally. So then we're into summer, now we're in July. So we, we're sucking in that CO, plants are the best carbon sequesters that then are gonna give it to the microbes who are gonna hold on to it for a good long time. So if you wanna invent a technology that's gonna sequester carbon, like some oil companies are doing and spending a lot of money and, and like building these big fancy things, plant a tree These and have, make sure that tree has access to good soil microbes. Okay, and then of course, we also see these white plumes coming out that are carbon monoxide from forest fires. So another complicated relationship that when we cut off the peoples that were managing the landscape who had relationships with fire to help make sure those were um, even and functioning, uh, those are now out of balance. Okay, so let's, let's just get in there and imagine. So this is the goal. 
right? For a till the plow, this was the goal with that technology. I can totally see why no carbon is getting sequestered into that and why it's just breathing. It's ex it's this soil is exhaling CO2. Not only that, it looks like a pretty hot place to be. It looks pretty dry and kind of a bummer. So the question, if you don't believe my um my hypothesis here that CO2 emission is following these tilling seasons, uh, scientists have measured and calculated that if all of the, the world's agricultural fields were to be no-till, meaning just you don't dig them up and like we did, um, we would reduce the global warming potential. And they had two different metrics, but I just gave you one graph because I figured that would be impactful enough for today. But if this is your jam, let's talk more. So there's potential to slow down global warming just by not tilling, which is awesome. Also, it's not just CO2 in the air and heat. We also get, if with all that loose dirt, you get any wind above a certain speed, we're getting more and more dust storms around the world, which are just devastating. People die in dust car wrecks. And not only that, the dust is landing somewhere and often it lands on the snow melt. When it lands on the snow, Something that's white is not going to absorb as much heat as something that is darker than white, which it heats up. And then what do you think happens to that snow when it heats up? Tell me louder. It melts and it's going to melt quickly. So what do we get when we get a lot of water? Flooding, ding, ding. Man, y'all are so smart. This is great. So then we have our water balance, our water cycle out of balance because there's no uh, the plants that were normally going to slow down this whole process are out of the picture. So we get drought and flooding. Both are symptoms of the same problem. So not only is it just the issue that there's too much water and not enough water in some places on Earth, but we also get increased fire intensity, which has a lot to do with how the fire is being managed in different landscapes. We get erosion. We're losing all of our soil. Um, the, there's projections about losing our top soil in the next 60 harvests or something. Um, plus this water looks gross to drink. And at the same time, we get less food production and we have starvation in the world. It's just a big bummer, right? And all of this is from the plow. One technology with long-term consequences that we couldn't have predicted. So really just that one technology was really got us into this dysbiosis. Any healthcare track folks? I know we do. Whoop, whoop. Uh, dysbiosis is where, is that term for when your gut is like out of balance, that there's something going on. So I haven't even begun to talk about the poisons we put down, but basically what happens next is the plants that are, are dying and not thriving like they used to be, are those are the food sources for fungi that are supposed to break them down. Those are the food sources for insects that are like, ooh, this plant's on its way out. I'm going to eat it. And so if our entire crops seem like they're on their way out because they're struggling, this is going to happen. We're going to get devastating, uh, ravaging pet crop pests. I'm putting it in parentheses because they're just insects that have been knocked out of their normal niche and are just doing what, the best they can. Um, so dysbiosis in our soil, that is this picture right here. How did we get here? Well, here's a little graphic I found online um, that shows essentially our long-term humanity history with agriculture. And we have only talked about this machine revolution so far. We haven't even gotten to the green revolution. We're gonna touch on that a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna glaze over this concept of hunter-gatherer to agriculture, because we're going to talk about that at the end again when we start talking about humanity and humans. Um, and honestly, I'm not even going to get to the digital revolution, but I have a lot to say to that on that as well. But so, OK, before I start telling you my laundry list of things that I foresee becoming problems, now that we've had a moment, um, click back into your phone mm -hmm. and let's add some more. What are. Or maybe let's let's go to the next one. And what are, did I go too far? I did. There we go. Let's add, add another one. What else? What else is happening with that list of where we just were? 
anything on here that makes you feel a little bit nervous or things that have a long-term consequence that we're not, that could be a good thing also that we don't know about. We got AI up here, we've got pesticides. A lot of these things that you've listed already are on this list for green or digital revolution. I don't even know what blockchains are, but we've got CRISPR modifying genes. We've got um, uh, poop transfusions, if you will, or if there's a fancier term for that that we'll talk about in class. Um, lots of different technologies. Toxic groundwater, agribusiness, climate change, cell phones. Dread, yeah, totally. There's a lot of dread. Basically, we are still not done. There's more. So my list also includes machines. Once we got to a certain level and we killed the life there, we started digging deeper. So then even digger, bigger, deeper plows um herbicides that then as soon as a tiny weed pops up we want it to look perfectly clean so let's repurpose war chemicals and poisons and make those um so that they can kill plants fungicides and insecticides i have an entire different talk that's going to be about that um so that's not today but they dislodge those organisms out of their normal habitats and give them a whole lot of food without any predators uh, drones replacing farmers to spray those poisons now i'm all about using targeted approaches. If you have to have to use a poison, I'd rather you just get a little bit on it instead of spraying the entire field. That'd be great. But I also want farmers to keep their jobs and more people to get that relationship with the land. Genetic modification to grow crops that can stand these conditions better. Instead of taking care of the land and managing it differently, we're trying to breed crops that can withstand the conditions we've created with our technology already. That seems backwards when we already have the diversity that we need in abundance if we protect it. Grain-fed livestock instead of letting them graze out in the field as they should, which then creates the nice healthy fats in their body that as a food source for us can be nourishing and vitamin rich instead of poisonous in our gut when they're gra grain-fed. Antibiotic use, we're gonna talk about this one, and then forest clear cuts that just deny any of those relationships between trees. We'll talk more about the mycorrhizal fungi and how they connect one another. But the personhood in indigenous communities that trees have is also important. Um, and of course, CRISPR, I saw a talk about modifying an entire gut microbiome of a cow before we completely understand how this might, we're just now understanding that microbiomes are important, which is gonna be the punchline. Okay. So let's get to the green revolution. We'll get through it. It's going to be okay. We got to talk about antibiotics and agrochemicals. So this is the picture of the green revolution. This is the goal, right? We got germ theory. We started learning at one point that a single bacterium can cause disease. One bacteria, one disease, therefore all microbes cause disease. So let's kill them. Um, that, this is what this looks like as well. It can be deceivingly green and yet entirely poisonous. So we're going to, again, not talk about agrochemicals. That's a whole different talk. We are going to talk about antibiotics, the miracle drug, which I am very grateful for. Uh, raise your hand if you um, have ever had an infection. Yeah. So not many of us would be here today without them um, because a lot of infections, just normal infections, can be deadly without antibiotics. Um, this is a cute graphic I found of um, when Fleming uh, came upon the one, the person who got famous for antibiotics. He, this is that initial plate with the penicillin colony. And what you can see here is a large colony of that fungus and then the bacteria not able to grow. These are the staphylococci right here. And then there's a zone of inhibition around it. Okay, so it's amazing. We can cure bacterial diseases. Yay, we need this, this is helpful. Awesome, cool, let's not die from hepatitis A or tuberculosis, and there are still people in the world who are, and that is devastating, but it has gone down. So here's the other thing that happens though. So this is a normal population that has, a this is your scale right here of resistance level. So 
the yellow ones have are really susceptible and able to die off when the bacteria when the antibiotics come but what happens is that a couple of them can survive when they experience antibiotics and then all of the ones that reproduce from that one has those genes that can allow them to survive the antibiotics so this is a picture of all of the antibiotics that we have and the date that they were first introduced on the market is the beginning of the box where it's a little bit thicker and then the date where antibiotic resistance was first discovered is the end of that box so what you can see on here is that it only took a few years if the box is empty the antibiotic resistance was discovered before it went to market which is amazing yeah right <laughs> did not know that um also fun fact we haven't discovered a new class of antibiotics since before I was born. So it's been a minute. Um, good old 1987. Um, the other devastating thing about uh, antibiotic use is that uh, while it is a very helpful thing for humans, a lot of them are actually going to livestock. And this is great. I want livestock to also be happy and healthy and not die of diseases. However, only a small portion of them are treating diseases. Whereas they're using antibiotics as a growth hormone in a lot of livestock. Um, I'll show you exactly how much in just a second. Not only as a growth hormone, but then just to prevent any potential infections. Here's the graph. So this is by country. And you can see Norway's doing pretty good. They're not really giving their livestock many antibiotics. But uh, we are right here in the middle. Um, not great. I did some math. And I found out that for this kilogram, milligrams per kilogram, so like by weight conversion, they are giving those animals 3.5 times the amoxicillin package recommended amount of antibiotics. So it's not, and that's not just because they're a bigger animal, I calculated it per weight. So the, not only are they giving them for growth reasons, not to treat disease, but also way more than would be prescribed to a human being. So then those animals are out in the fields or hopefully they're in a field or they're, they're pooping, right? And I found another paper that showed the antibiotics aren't even decomposed. So it's like 70 to 90% of the antibiotic makes it all the way through the gut fully untouched. So not only are the microbes in their gut getting exposure to these antibiotics and becoming resistant, they're also pooping out just a slurry of here, microbes, get used to this stuff so that we can't use these tools anymore to treat infections. Scary. When in reality, these cows should be, this is a, these are photos from Gabe Brown's Ranch, a regenerative farmer, where the grass is taller than the cow. This is possible. So in reality, this is where these animals are living that are receiving this dosage of antibiotics. They are living without it just looks sad. They don't, they're don't. they living without green. We all need green to be happy, healthy beings on this planet. Um, and I can see why they're getting more infections and having more reproductive fertility rates issues and health issues. And if you want to learn more, I'll direct you in the right places. But it's very sad. It's a very sad animal welfare thing. So the human side of that is that the interesting thing, whether it is because of our use of antibiotics or other changes that happened around the same time, I'm not going to say, but we started getting an increase in chronic diseases. So allergies, uh, Crohn's disease, all kinds of other things, all of these disorders that are not tied to an individual bacteria, there's something dysregulated with our inflammation. Our T cells and B cells are like, ah, 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 they're having trouble. Um, so. What's the story? Again, I'm not gonna specifically point to one thing, but I will say that the nutrient density of our food in that time, since we've been treating the soils and our guts with this germ theory thinking, uh, has gotten less nutritious. So a carrot, what is it? You'd have to eat six carrots um, to get the same nutrients that your grandparents had eaten to get that same carrot amount of carrot, which is wild. So something's going on dysbiosis in our guts. This is a serious issue. Um, has anyone heard of the gut-brain axis? 
What about the gut heart axis or the gut bone axis or the gut, you name it, axis? The, our digestive, our immunity is in our colon, essentially. That is learning from the microbes. So this definition of what a microbe is used to be, and this is another like concept of technology that we need to change. Technology can be an idea. It can be a definition. So a microbe being a very small living thing, especially one that causes disease that can only be seen with a microscope is from the Oxford English Dictionary. And we also have an extremely small living thing that you can only see under a microscope that may cause disease. So if you didn't know better, you'd think one, they're really small and two, they're a problem, let's kill them. I think it is time for a change because in reality, 90% of the diseases can be traced back to a lack of the microbes that are needed, the right microbes in the right place, whether it's in the soil or in the gut, but 90% of all disease can be reached in some way back to the gut and health of the microbiome. So time for a change. So instead, what if we go from germ theory to thinking about having this symbiosis with our guts, collaborating with these microbes? Uh, this is a great image by Martin. Oh, I'm not going to say that, but a great image um, that just that shows the complex. This is a real image of a colon that shows micro the biodiversity of bacteria in a colon sample. So that's pretty cool. Let's form symbiosis with our guts. And not only that, not only do we have to change our thinking about microbes, but we also have to change our microbiomes as we age if we want to live longer and stay healthier. Because a human being has to have a different microbiome as a baby to into adulthood and into aging in order to age well, which is kind of cool to think. But how do we do this? What do we do? So the question I'm going to pose for the rest of this time is what could become possible if we cultivate diverse communities? And let me get it going for you. I would love to know what you think before I tell you what I think. In that way, we can have a conversation. What could become possible if we cultivate diverse communities? And then we'll talk about how. Feel free to talk out loud too. It's not a quiet lecture. Longevity, healthier, happier, better health. Less stress, yes please. More connection. Cultivate diverse communities. More fun, yes. Resilience, longer lifespan, better problem solving. Excellent. Whole foods, more co cooperation, less methane. Methanogens are important, they have a role, but being out of balance with that's also bad. Happier people, I love it. So one of the ones that I, you can keep, you can keep entering as you see things, if you'd like. Um, I'll try to keep this up. And let's go to that colon. So if we zoom in, I know it's not quite as beautiful as Martin's photograph of the actual bacteria in your poop waiting to get pushed out. But the, there are microbes, obviously, that live there as residents. And so to orient you, this this right here, these commensal bacteria is what we're looking at right here. Um, and so what they're on top of are a whole bunch of mucus, hopefully. If, you're, if you have a good healthy microbiome or good healthy gut cells, they're producing a lot of mucus, just like good healthy plants also produce a lot of mucus just through their roots. That's a whole different story. But you've got a good, this goblet cells just pumping out the mucus. These microbes are like, oh yeah, that's a great place to live. Cool. And then they are eating the food that you eat. And if it's full of fiber and stuff, then they're producing these short chain fatty acids. Um, so anyone taking nutrition already? No? Cool. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. 
short chain fatty acids, the acetate, butyrate, propionate, those molecules are what feed your gut cells. So your cells need to eat, right? So these cells right here are eating those byproducts, basically the fermented product. You have like a little miniature brewery right in your colon where these microbes are taking your fibers and turning them into byproducts that we that feed our cells, make them healthy and allow them to make that good mucus. Not only that, but we've got these cute little dendritic cells that these purple ones that like they stick a little arm up between the cells because all there's a huge amount of immune cells in your gut that are right behind that little wall of cells that separate all the the poop and bacteria and all that stuff. Um, on the other side of the colon cells is where a lot of your immune cells live. So B cells, T cells. Um, so this little purple one, it has a little arm that it sticks up and it like kind of samples, waves around. It's like, oh, I got something new. And it finds information from the bacteria that are living in your gut it then has a conversation. It's like, hey, hey, T-cell, I found something weird. Maybe you can deal with it. It's like me calling in IT to get set up here. And then they go deal with it. Then the dendritic cell goes back and is like, who else is, oh, you're normal, you're good. So much so that there are theories that the microbiome is actually what, so having those bacteria providing feedback to the cells is what shaped the way our immune system works. So through evolution, we wouldn't have our immune system if we didn't have our microbes to teach them how to be immune cells, which is cool. So again, that's a whole different area to deep dive on. Um, how do we get this? It does start with those dietary fibers. So let's talk about some dietary fibers and what that means. Um, here you have my um, watercolor image of hopefully a nice diverse field. Again, what could be possible if we cultivate diverse communities? I would also say we'd have um, different varietals of all of the food instead of just all one kind of thing. Carrots didn't start out as orange. Isn't that crazy? But now we all think of them as orange. Anyway, side note. Um, so if we eat good fibers, and fibers are in the cellulose in all of those plant cells, fibers are in the whole gray or brown rice, if you don't take that husk off of the rice, um, there's a lot of other things there as well. And what's in that material? What's a plant made of? And this graphic is lovely because it shows how different, using the periodic table, I know chemistry was just in here. If anyone stayed, this will look familiar. Um, the green highlighted, the yellow and the blue are all different mineral elements that are important for plants to have and grow and have different functions. There's a whole different seminar, but for now, the main point is the way that we grow our food actually changes and makes available all that full suite of elemental co um, components. The issue is a lot of fertilizers are only nitrogen, phosphorus, pot and potassium, or maybe you can dump a whole bunch of lime or calcium, like all kinds of other supplements that don't make it into the plant quite as effectively as a microbe. So this table here shows a comparison between a bunch of conventionally farmed farms and they analyzed the nutrients in that tissue. You've got all the vitamins, vitamin K, E, C, B1, et cetera. And then we've got some phenolics, phytosterols, phytosterols, carotenoids, and then a bunch of elements that are essential to our bones, blood, immunity, et cetera, that we need to get from our food. Um, vitamins didn't used to be a thing, but I'm grateful for them too. Um, so what you can see here is that if the number is above one, the regenerative farm had more. So it's a one-to-one -one comparison. So if it is like 1.1, then it was, then the regeneratively farmed plants had 10% more. So 1.20 phenolics for all crops, Alex, than those conventionally farmed plants. Or, or let's take another one, all above one, but it looks pretty good. It's pretty um, compelling that if you grow using practices that take care of soil microbial life like a diverse community, we could have nutrient dense food. So if you need more convincing, I'm happy to do it later. 
how does this happen is the question. The reason is that microbes invented metabolism. Microbes eat rocks. So chemolithotrophy is chemical eating, chemical rock eating, basically. So there are microbes that can live off of, the, they can break up the silica, they can eat the, the phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, et cetera, whatever's in that rock. And they put it in their bodies and then they die, which is great. So also, I love this title for the blog. Scientists waited two and a half years to see whether bacteria can eat rock. And this is an actual photograph from that study um, where they waited two and a half years. And they're like, oh, actually, physical weathering is actually bacteria eating rock, which is cool. Anything that you think happens without a microbe probably happens with a microbe. Like the entire nitrogen cycle is all microbes. So then what happens? So the bacteria puts the stuff in their bodies and they can access I don't know if I pointed this out, but this periodic table shows you which elements microbes can access and use, which is essentially anything you could want. And then those bodies being full of magnesium, calcium, potassium, whatever your plant wants, is they get gobbled up. This is a gif, or some may say gif, of an amoeba that is like just taking in bacteria and consuming them. I believe it is a time lapse, but still awesome. An amoeba is, our, is a single-celled eukaryote, but um, one of our more closely related microbes to us than they are to bacteria. So that's cool. When protozoa were included in this one study um, by Mary Ann Clawholm, nitrogen was taken up by the plants. It increased by 75%. So just the presence of these predators in the system. It's just like moose and wolves, right? If you have predators in a system, nutrients cycle differently. So amoeba equals predator. Remember, bacteria are made not only of nitrogen, but they're also made of calcium, phosphorus, potassium. That whole periodic table that I showed you a moment ago is what is in all of those little black dots that this amoeba is taking in. So now they are just a nutrient bag, basically, with covered by a membrane. Um, there you go. There's that periodic table. Um, another fun aside, this is an image of red blood cells and then a white blood cell chasing down a bacteria in the bloodstream. So this shows you the side, the perspective of size, but it also like, it kind of reminds me of soil amoeba eating a bacteria. So I kind of feel like we have like internal amoeba that are hunting and doing that. Whereas, uh, although they are of our own cells, they're not a separate entity. Just what even is a single organism anymore, you know? Makes sense how endosymbiotic theory happened. So just a, a fun aside, I'm also curious if anyone happens to know, do we get nutrients from the bacteria that our white blood cells eat? I would assume so. Like, I don't know. Anyway, we'll come back to that. <laughs> I think this is a time lapse, but yeah, there's there's all kinds of chemical interactions going on, right? I am sure if that bacterium has, they must have some kind of flagella or some way to like, oh no, right? <laughs> and if you're a white blood cell, you probably smell different than a red blood cell to that bacteria. Um, yeah, the whole world is a chemical world. We're just terrible at sensing it. Everything else is like this, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, but we're gonna go back to the soil for just a moment and spend less time in our bloodstream because how do we get, Okay, great. We've got a bag covered in a membrane full of nutrients that is an amoeba. Then we have other, well, and before that, we also have many other predators. So a good, what could become possible if we cultivate diverse communities, we also then have resilience in a system. Because if for some reason all of the nutrients die, then we have nematodes who can eat those bacteria and just gobble them up with their little nematode muscles. And then we have flagella or flagellates that have um, there are little flagella here on the side. We have ciliates that are just swimming around, gobbling up tons of bacteria. There are more protists on this world than most of us who were trained in classical biology ever realized. And then there's a predator for the predator, which gets even more fun. So this is a nematode being consumed by another nematode, which is awesome and kind of weird. Um, and then here's an amoeba that's consuming a couple ciliates. Uh, this one is an amoeba that's consuming a, an algal cell. So this is basically an herbivore 
So that's a little bit different, but just wanted to show different kinds of interactions. And then this one is wild. This is a nematode who like smelled prey, but was tricked by a fungus. And that fungus had like an inner tube, basically, that the nematode swam through. And then as soon as it did, it triggered the cells to inflate. And then it trapped them and is chemically drilling into that nematode's cuticle where it will eat it from the inside out and fill it with a whole bunch of spores and then burst out and do it again. Which is great if you're a farmer and you have a problem with nematodes on your roots. You want these fungi there, right? Which is the next concept of biocontrol, but I'm not there yet. So then we have this amoeba that has a shell. It's called a testate amoeba, and it is eating a nematode by either grabbing the tail. They can also pack hunt. They can gather around and pack hunt nematodes. There are so many cool biological interactions on the microbe, the, the world. So I guess I didn't add this, but right now I'm feeling a whole lot of wonder is possible if we cultivate diverse communities. Because here's that biocontrol concept. If you're a farmer and you have a nematode problem, you want that fungi. If you have a caterpillar problem, well, you want a lot of different things. This is actually an endospore, whoop, whoop, uh, an endospore that has a toxin in it from a bacillus species, bacillus thuringiensis, BT, if you will, um, that can explode a cat caterpillar's gut because of the way it interacts. Um, has anyone heard of BT corn? A little bit. So BT corn is um, where they took that gene and put it into the plant cells so that all of the plant cells from the corn plant, then if they interact with the caterpillar, will burst that caterpillar's gut. Cool idea, right? Technology. But the unforeseen consequence is that then the pollen that gets dispersed and an a endangered monarch butterfly consumes it. Like it's a, another one of those unforeseen consequences um, that has run away from us in a wild way. I'm not in, implicating any company except for Monsanto. <laughs> I don't have tenure yet. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Um, there's also entomopathogenic fungi, which is crazy. Any Last of Us fans? There's a TV show called The Last of Us. Thank you. Yes. Um, this is the concept, right? So a fungus, a spore gets inside and then they're like, oh, this is a good food. They burst out and turn, turn all of your pests into fuzzy little teddy bears, which is really cute. Um, I'm also going to avoid saying the word pest because I don't believe that anyone is a pest on this earth or anyone is a pathogen because in reality you could use these like a pesticide you could take these spores and go and put them out there and that'd be way better than a toxin i am all for that yes please or we could just have management practices that support the diversity so that these these elements are naturally in the soil so this uh called managing land in a way that suppresses these pests and diseases and allow them to do their normal ecological job where it's supposed to be Okay, wow. Then if we're talking, getting bigger and bigger, those were microbes eating insects. Insects also eat insects. And here's a cool one that I study. This was from the end of my PhD. And, oh, gotcha. Uh, this is a parasitoid wasp uh, that was inside of this aphid and then burst out. Uh, we, there were also parasitoid wasps. There's a wasp for everything, really. Here's one that um, lays its eggs on the caterpillar and then turns that caterpillar into a caterpillar skin rug. Okay, we have about one minute, so I'm going to cruise through a few of the very complicated topics, um, but we can talk about it in a minute if need be. If you do need to go, I respect that. So then we keep getting bigger and bigger predators all the way up so that we get fish and birds and salamanders and lace wings and praying mantises and dragonflies. And what's why does that matter? Uh, a friend of mine recently said, it feels quietly subversive to be so continuously in love with the world. So I wanna, one, just put out their inherent value, which I love that. Um, and also there are so many like practical ecological values, but we care about bears because we care about bears. That's awesome, they belong to be here. Um, so life begets life. And this is where we're gonna start to step even way back. What could become possible if we cultivate diverse communities? Uh, this woman, Dr. Suzanne Samard, 
discover, this is a, an image from her book, Finding the Mother Tree, which I recommend. Um, and she was a major player in defending the microbial partners of the trees and did all kinds of crazy studies she describes in the book that, um, yeah, are fighting for management practices in forests that defend these microbial partnerships that allow resilient forests. So this is a picture of trees and actual connections. And this arrow is pointing at the most connected mother tree in the whole situation. Oh, I do believe we're probably at time. So if anyone does, need, can I roll over or you want to pause? If you need to leave, feel free to leave. But if you want to stick around, let's talk a little bit more. Cool. Is there a class right after? Thanks, Ashley. Don't know. Okay. We'll cool. find out. <laughs> we'll find it. They'll come join. It's going to be great. We'll just smooth in. Okay. So one of my favorite stories of this, um, one of the things that becomes possible is that we gain more ways of knowing. So having science is great, but also having other ways of knowing that have been practiced for since time immemorial, there's so much to gain from learning from different people and different cultures. This specifically is the Menominee Reservation in Wisconsin. Uh, you can see it because it's a green spot on the map. Um, and when scientists surveyed the trees, this Menominee Reservation, which is actively logged, actively managed for old growth, but logged, they found more of every kind of tree. Well, they found more total trees and a greater evenness and balance of trees in those forests um, based on those management practices. And you can see it. So this is a forest that's being actively managed by the indigenous community um, on that Menominee Reservation. So there's a lot to learn for how can we cultivate more diverse communities. And there are people actively practicing practices that can help us do that. Um, so this brings us back to the full circle. Which of these looks more fun to you? Huh? <laughs> what could become possible? The piece that's missing here is the human beings, right? Because this is really possible, but it takes human beings. This is an example from the Los Plateau. Um, a gentleman named John D. Liu was a part of this project as a videographer. And the people were the secret. The people got together and they terraced the land and put straw into the soil so the dew could collect so that some kind of microbial community could form. It was all people. And that is the part that we forget how important it can be. So these are real photos of what is possible. So that graphic that I showed is not just a dream. And John D. Lou says, this is the great work of our time, which I believe with. And I believe that there's so much more to know. So this is a woman named Dr. Lila June Johnston, who gives, this is an amazing talk that she got, gave. So I gave you the full, like, what it looks like on YouTube. Um, and this right here, as a trained classical ecologist, this totally blew my mind. Because here, uh, Dr. Johnston's pointing out that it's not just, it, the biodiversity that we know in the Amazon is not an accident. That this has been cultivated by generating thousands and thousands of years worth of land management practices that were long-term thinking, that planned for the, the biodiversity in the world that's there. So if you can see here, this the black dots are all of the area that was intensively compost in the soil. And so that compost is generating the, the soils in the Amazon are very nutrient poor. And so I remember taking a tropical ecology class in, in college and like, okay, that makes sense. They must grow sideways roots and get the nutrient. But no, it's not an accident um, that the Amazon is so diverse. It's because the human beings there, and there's so many different examples of areas that were cultivated. The, the people didn't chase the buffalo. The bison followed the fire that the humans were creating to grow nutrient dense grass. Um, these communities were intentionally managed in ways that didn't look like a field. So they didn't look like they were being managed. And so that is where this miscommunication is. And this is where we can start to repair. Because as Dr. Johnston says, for every acre that we can regenerate using some of this indigenous knowledge and these ways of knowing, we should think about figuring out how to get an acre of land back to those communities. And not that everything needs to be given back or belong to an indigenous person, but that 
there is such a disparity. So there's potential in this work to take care of the 5% of the world's population alive today that have protected 80% of our diversity. And I keep these connections up because I think it's just so important for us to recognize how interconnected we are, that we can save more seeds and diversity and have more food resilience as a humanity. Um, this is Dr. Vandana Shiva. She's also an incredible woman to know about um, and the artist who did this cool seed art. Final note on that, um, it's not only indigenous people, but many peoples were displaced or um, dispossessed of land, often violently. This graph shows the uh, number, the ownership of land by white landowners and black landowners. And you can see that um, black farmers have not had the same opportunities to have access to food equity and nutrition in the same way that um, white landowners do. So we can begin to repair some very deep wounds through this work, but we have to talk about it. We have to get in there and it can be messy. And I, you know, I don't even know how to do it right necessarily, but I want to have the conversation just to make sure we do. And then all of these people who have different ideas and perspectives can be a part of this movement, can be amplified. So um, I have a whole list of people that if anyone is interested, I will give you all of the people to lift them up because they could tell you a lot more than I could. And then as a final benefit, what could become possible if we cultivate diverse communities, human connection and spirit? I have been a part of so many human communities that have done amazing work by working together and by being outside together and working towards getting to know one another and the land. So developing a connection with the land is not only food security, it is essential to our health and spirit. So this is my plan in our microbiology class. So this is why we're gonna make some compost together as a team. This is why my online class are cultivating sourdough starters and any other kind of fermented food that they can. With these questions in mind, what could become possible in your life? How can caring for your microbes, to, or how are you caring for your microbes today? And how can you increase the life in your life? So I'll leave you with this final note. Technology and change. My guiding principle is, does it increase life? And my, I would love to hear from you. What are your ethical decision-making principles? How do you decide what? Ba -ba -ba -ba. Let's see. How can you frame your ethical decision-making because we have a lot of decisions ahead of us. We have all of those things that you just talked about. We have pesticides, we have AI, we have genetic modification, we have uh, two-factor authentication to log into Canvas. We have all kinds of things. <laughs> how, how do you decide? What is your guiding light? And maybe that's a bigger question and not one that you can just pop in right away. But if you have ideas, I want to hear them because the more ideas we share with one another, the better off we are. So that's what can become possible, I believe. Thank you very much. Let's Thanks give it for a staying. <laughs> so I think we probably can't do a Sorry question that, yeah. and answer at the end, but you know, hey, reach out, talk with us afterwards and stuff. But other than that, uh, please come back again next week. We look forward to seeing your happy faces and learn more about technology in lots of different ways. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.